Hello, and welcome back to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea today, and I will be your host. I will be talking to Thomas from Spirochem, a Swiss company that focuses on the design and synthesis of novel building blocks for the use in drug discovery, as well as focus on the development on new spirocyclic molecules. We will be talking to him about what spirocyclic molecules are, their properties, and how they're being used in pharma. And we will also dive into the use of AI in drug discovery, automation in the chemical industry, and how to protect intellectual property from being lost. I'm really excited to have Tomas on the podcast today, so let's jump straight into it. Hi, Tomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, It's really exciting. I'm really happy to have you on. So why don't we start by having you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Good morning and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to to be here and uh, have a chance to introduce myself and my company. Um, So my name is Thomas Fessard. I'm a chemist by training. Uh, I was born in France, grew up there, started my studies in Montpellier, moved to the UK for a PhD in Nottingham and uh, moved again to Switzerland, where I did a, P- a postdoc with uh, Eric Kaira at, uh, at the ETH. Um, I stayed in Switzerland uh, for the last uh, 15 years, uh, where uh, I was working first for a biotech company uh, in Zurich. And uh, 10 years ago, I decided to start uh, Sparrowcam uh, with uh, Eric Kaira uh, as a co-founder. And... Um, we started a small, a small company spin-off uh, of uh, ETH uh, with uh, two, two employees, uh, myself being in the lab. And we have grown uh, uh, over the years and we have now more than 60 employees and we relocated to Basel uh, four years ago. Very interesting. So there's actually two questions that I straight away have. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> but, no, no, right. no problem. So um, first of all, you said you did a PhD in chemistry, but then you started working for a company in biotechnology. Were you doing something chemistry related there or did you switch fields into biotech? Well, no, actually, uh, uh, biotech is a, is a generic word for um, for companies that work in the life science. In fact, um, you could have biotech that work, work on antibodies. So obviously, there's not much chemistry uh, there. Or, uh, or biotech companies that work with small molecules and uh, that try to develop new molecules that would inhibit some pathways, biological pathways. So biotech is a, is a generic term for this industry. It's in fact, if you want, it's a, it's pharma in a smaller setting. Okay, I got it. Um, and then second of all, so you mentioned that you work for Spirochem. So what do they do? What does your company do? So Spirochem, we started uh, with the idea that um, uh, pharma doesn't have time, so big pharma uh, doesn't have time to develop new building blocks, new motifs that can be used to improve molecules or to, to, it's like Lego pieces that you attach together to make a molecule that one day will become uh, hopefully a a drug to to treat uh, some disease. Uh, And big pharma um, is based at assembling the pieces, but maybe not at designing new Lego pieces, new building blocks. So the idea was really to to, uh, to increase the set of building blocks that could be available to them uh, to, to find uh, and assemble and make the drugs of tomorrow. Um, so that was the idea. Uh, we started Sparrowchem uh, making Sparrow Cycles. So that's why we chose that name, uh, because uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, it was discovered by the group of Eric Aira at ETH that those molecules have uh, some interesting properties, uh, intrinsic properties uh, that they bring to the molecules that contain them. So we, we call the company Sparrow Game uh, because of that. But we uh, grew as a portfolio to include all the pieces, all the building blocks that uh, have other properties. So in fact, now Sparrow Game, has, uh, we have the, probably the largest uh, and the most diverse collection of building blocks that could be used by pharma or life science companies in general uh, to make uh, ho- hopefully the drugs of tomorrow. But uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. But um, the story 
continuous. Um, uh, actually, that's the, it was a plan A. Uh, we still do uh, catalog products and building blocks, but uh, in fact, we realize that the industry is shifting uh, and uh, going more towards the biotechnology field. And by this, I mean uh, more uh, small companies are now developing drugs uh, uh, or trying to develop new drugs. Um, and for that, they need a lot of help in the lab. So Sparrowchem is now also providing service in R&D. So we do catalog, we have libraries of compounds, but we also do the research for our clients. Okay, um, so let's just rewind a tiny bit. And first of all, can you maybe describe to the audience exactly what a spirocyclic molecule is? So a spirocyclic molecule is um, a molecule that contains two cycles, so two rings that are connected together by one atom. So if you, obviously you don't see the video, but uh, it's, if, if you take your, your two hands and make two, two cycles, if you connect them in the middle, that's a spirocycle. Yeah, that was a good explanation. I think maybe we can like put a picture um, yeah. on on our like Twitter or Instagram or something. Do <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's very interesting. And when exactly did you start this company? Was it right after your PhD? Oh, you said you worked a, a tiny bit, but did you already have this idea as you were working for the other company? Or was this something that came very spontaneously um, after you left Eric Carrera's group? Oh, so there are many stories, uh, uh, many sides of the story. So I don't know which one I will tell you today. Today, but uh, um, let me start with uh, with acknowledging someone. So um, uh, when I started my postdoc with uh, Eric Herrera, I was uh, in a, in a lab with a, a very talented chemist called Georg Wojcik. He's now working for Roche uh, in Basel, and he was the first PhD student or the first uh, scientist to work in the Kara group on uh, those uh, small rings, oxetans and spirocycles. And he was my lab mate, so I, I was probably the second person on Earth to see the molecules that uh, that he was uh, he was making. Uh, and uh, at that time, I said, "Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, it, it could be a good idea of a business." Business. And obviously, the idea was to, to really develop this in, connect, in collaboration with Roche. So it was Eric Herrera, uh, Klaus Müller at Roche, and uh, Georg uh, in the lab uh, who were developing those. It was more fundamental research, trying to, uh, to uh, explore the properties of these molecules because they were new at the time. Um, so I had already a first glimpse into spiral cycles at the time. And then obviously, when you finish your postdoc, you look for jobs. I got a, 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 an opportunity to work in a biotech company. And uh, um, so a small company that had just been uh, started and financed. And uh, just after my postdoc, I could uh, take some responsibilities as a head of chemistry. So I, I stayed there for four years, but um, I always had in mind that uh, I wanted to do something. And uh, the opportunity came four years later. I came back to, to Eric and said, why don't you do it? Why don't we do it uh, together? And he said, yes. And that's the uh, beginning of Sparrow yeah, very interesting. The thing is, like, I mean, as a chemist myself, I know that these spiral cycles, they're really not so easy to synthesize. And, you know, if I have to do it in the lab myself, I think it would be a bit challenging. So especially when you started off the company, did you how many people did you have working and trying to develop these spiral cycles? Were you in the wet lab, for example, or did you have to employ quite a few other chemists? Well, yeah, I must say that uh, I've, I was myself in the lab uh, uh, until uh, not so long ago, uh, maybe four or five years ago uh, that I left the lab. But uh, the first few years at Sparrowcam, I was still uh, helping out. But obviously, with a growing team and more responsibilities, you end up uh, starting things and not being able to finish them or <laughs> giving the reactions to, to, to walk up to, to your colleagues. So there's a moment in your career when you need to say, OK, what, what is the best use of your time and uh, where uh, uh, where are you the most useful? But uh, yes, I was in the lab at the beginning. So obviously with uh, with the training we get uh, in the CARA group, um, uh, we are uh, able to make, to work on those uh, on those complex molecules. Um, and the, the strength of Sparrowchem has always been to hire uh, the best synthetic chemists uh, available. So it's very imp important for us to, uh, to, to hire people who can handle uh, uh, the, the, the complexity of, uh, of chemistry that we do around spiral cycles or other motifs that, uh, that we develop. Yeah. And so um, at the beginning, how many people did you start off with? 
Well, myself. Just <laughs> and, you. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, it was myself, and obviously we have uh, we quickly hired a, a couple of chemists. Then we received some grants from the Swiss government to develop more building blocks. And uh, with uh, the company generating revenues, we could hire more people. Uh, so I would say that uh, the first few years were uh, uh, a slow growth, um, uh, starting from one chemist myself 10 years ago, up until the first six years, we grew to about 20, 20 chemists or 20 employees, if you want. Um, and so the acceleration started three years ago. Um, because I think there was a switch in the industry uh, where more and more biotech companies, biotechnology companies uh, were started, especially in North America, in Boston, in California, um, and they needed more, more resources. And uh, those companies say they need to go fast. They need to, to, to work with the best. And uh, luckily, we were identified as, uh, as the best company providing this kind of service. Uh, so that really generated a lot of demand. And that's why we, we could hire more and more chemists. Uh, now, 55 chemists, 60 employees in the company. Wow, that's a, that's a big increase. So can we go back into a bit more detail for you to explain us what exactly these spiral cycles are used for, um, where they're useful, what industry in particular, and how, how they're used. So spiral cycles have uh, uh, interesting properties. Uh, so uh, it was the original work of, uh, of uh, Eric Ayer and Klaus Müller uh, and Georg Wichik uh, and a few other postdocs uh, afterwards uh, in the group. Uh, at ETH that uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, those small spiral cycles, when compared to the uh, monocyclic equivalent, if you want, uh, had uh, slight variations in their properties, whether it's solubility, pKa of uh, amines that would be uh, also of, of uh, nitrogen that is included in those, uh, in those uh, cycles. Uh, it could be the lipophilicity. Uh, of these uh, these uh, small, small motifs that uh, that varies, and all these parameters uh, um, are interesting when you want to develop a new drug, um, and that's what we call bioisocerism. It's a replacement of one motif by another uh, that hopefully would have the same um, affinity to the biological target to the protein, if you want, um, but with slightly different uh, properties. So that's what uh, industry, the industry is looking for. It's, uh, it's actually increasing the repertoire of motifs that they can use. You know, it's like being in a, in a, uh, uh, in a, in a kitchen and uh, you want to, to, to cook a, a, new, a new dish and, uh, and you want to have as many spices and, uh, and ingredients around you in order to, 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 to make the best, uh, best dish. And it's the same in, a, in, a, in discovery uh, to, to make new drugs. You want to have as many small pieces, small motifs available so that you can assemb assemble them together and see which one is best. So that so that's the thing. So it's basically uh, uh, the certain properties of these power cycles and also the diversity that that, that they that they bring. Okay, and so are they mainly used in, um, for example, changing the way a drug is right now? So if we take I don't know ibuprofen or something, and then instead of having carbonyl, you could replace it with an oxetane, for example. Is mm -hmm. that where you see these spiral cycles used in, or would you say no? We want to make brand new drugs using these spiral cycles. Both. I, I actually, the, the, the original idea was to do exactly what you described, is to replace one piece. Uh, so you mentioned Oxetent, it's not a spiral cycle, but it's it's one of oh, the yeah. building blocks that we have at Sparrowcare. Um, and it was uh, the, the first project uh, that uh, we worked on. So carbonyl replaced by Oxetent, that's a bioisoceric switch or isoceric switch. Uh, and it was the idea at the beginning, and we still do a lot of that, actually, uh, and our clients do that as well. Um, but uh, with uh, the, the, uh, the, the new way uh, people do research and do uh, 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 start their projects, we see that there is a demand for novelty. And that's also uh, in connection with uh, the uh, improvement of CompuChem and, uh, and, uh, and the arrival of AI in the biotech field. Um, now the, the, we have the computing power 
we as an industry, uh, not necessarily at Sparkem, although we are involved in that, but uh, we have the ability to make virtual molecules, libraries of virtual molecules, so arrangement of atoms in many different ways, um, and screen them against a target in silico. And for that, if you want to be efficient, you need to have as many virtual molecules possible. And that's why spiral cycles and all the molecules that we develop, they bring novelty into those, uh, those uh, uh, virtual libraries. Um, you, you mentioned in silico, so I'm going to stop you there. What, what does in silico mean? So in silico means in the computer. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, we have in vitro, which is in a, in a flask, in vivo, which is in a, a living organism. In silico is, in fact, everything that is done in a computer. Um, so, for example, CompuChem is uh, in silico chemistry, yeah. uh, if you want. Oh, wow. Okay. So, actually, I was going to ask that as well, because I was really interested to see how, if you guys use some kind of AI um, or computational chemistry it, to develop molecules. So, clearly, you do, right? Do you... Do you think maybe you can expand a bit on that? Like how yes. much computational chemistry do you guys do? Uh, more and more, actually. Um, we started as a hardcore synthetic chemist, uh, working in the lab, getting our hands dirty um, and uh, spending long hours trying to, to make and purify molecules. But um, uh, three years ago, we have started to, to look at, uh, especially because there is a demand in the industry for, for, for more AI, or machine learning applied to, to projects. Um, so we started to look at that and uh, we have received a, a grant from the Swiss government to work with a, a machine learning group in, in Geneva uh, that are experts at uh, developing new algorithms. So we have this very active collaboration uh, with a, a, an academic group uh, in Geneva to develop new models for generating novel molecules in silico, so basically giving us ideas, being able to predict some of the properties uh, that uh, they would have. Uh, and then we pick the one that uh, looks the most promising and we make them in the lab. So it's a sort of, uh, um, uh, it doesn't uh, bring more uh, creativity in the way we design the molecules, but it allows us to, uh, to focus on the one that are the most likely to be useful. Yeah. So here, just to um, make it clear to everyone here, we're talking about a larger molecule, so a pharmaceutical, for example, and then you've added on a, a spiral cycle somewhere, right? Exactly. Well, we, we could even do that at, the, at the, the level of the building block itself of the motif, because each motif has uh, uh, intrinsic properties that, uh, that could be... Um, uh, given to the rest of the molecule. Uh, we have published that with, uh, with uh, we have a, we had a small collaboration with Novartis in Basel uh, a few years ago. Well, in fact, we looked at a replacement of uh, benzene rings, so flat aromatic rings, uh, very common in, in, in pharma. And we tried to replace them with a small three-dimensional units, so bicyclopentanes, bicyclo-111 pentanes, PCPs. Um, and those small pieces. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll put a picture in the show yeah, notes. I, I, send you <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> I think I'm not sure if a lot of people but, know what yeah. you mean. But those <laughs> small okay. units actually as like are like small cages, three dimensional cages that have more or less the same size or the same, same distance as a, a bending ring. Um, but uh, they are three dimensional, so uh, they are a cage. They are not flat aromatics. And in fact, this character, this three-dimensional character, has some importance in, a, in a, for example, solubility or, or the molecules, or because it, it prevents by stacking. So the so stacking of, of, uh, of aromatic sheets together. Um, uh, it can also improve so the, uh, so, uh, lipophilicity. Um, and we have published uh, this, uh, this uh, study with, uh, with colleagues from Novartis, showing that, in fact, uh, small units like this in larger uh, molecules, they really bring uh, uh, or, or the, the properties that, that uh, they bring is extended to the full molecule. So working on, on the pieces, understanding how they, uh, how they behave, uh, what are their intrinsic properties, can be useful to predict how a larger molecule uh, will, uh, will be. Yeah. And so 
on the market right now, are there any kinds of drugs that include some of your spiral cycles? Uh, there are some uh, spirocyclic molecules. Um, I cannot disclose uh, uh, this. Uh, unfortunately, we have been actively involved in a project where we managed to help a company to uh, to scale up uh, a spiral cycle. And that's uh, all I can do right now. Um, I must say that uh, there's no marketed drug at the moment with approval that uh, contains one of these uh, spiral cycles or bicycles because it's just too early. You know that uh, to, from the start of a project to market approval by the FDA or the uh, uh, EMEA, you, uh, you need minimum 10 years, probably 12, 15 years. So we started working only 10 years ago. So we know that some molecules are currently in a, in a clinical stage uh, evaluation. Uh, in humans, and they are progressing very well, uh, but uh, it's too early for them to, to be on the market already, but that will come. Yeah, actually, that makes total sense. Um, I was more asking because I was wondering whether, because when you do like the in, uh, in silico studies, how they actually, the data that you get out from that, how it compares to the data that you obtain in labs, whether it's a, there's a good correlation there. Well, it's all about data. Uh, every algorithm that you use needs to be trained on on a set of data. And the more data we have to feed into the machine, if you want, the better the prediction will be. Um, so we have also this, uh, this uh, project uh, at Parochem to measure, not only predict, to measure properties of uh, every molecule that we do. Because that will allow us to feed this data into the machine and the algorithm will feed and learn on that so that the prediction will be always better. And we need to do that ourselves to, to measure those properties. So we, are in, we have invested in, um, in equipment that allow us to measure solubility, lipophilicity, PKA very reliably in the same manner because uh, the homogeneity of the data is very important. We could do that with literature data, but you know it's scattered. Uh, it was measured on different instruments by different people in different countries. Very difficult to 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 feed uh, uh, to feed the data that is not homogeneous into uh, into a system, and uh, hope to get uh, reliable predictions. So we are very active at generating enough data that uh, will make our predictions, our predictive algorithms, much more reliable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also had a question. So if you took a known drug that has been um, patented, you know, 20 years ago or something and that doesn't have a patent anymore from a, a big pharma company like Pfizer or something, and you take this drug that works and then you replace, for example, a carbonyl with a spirocycle or you add on a spirocycle to slightly change it where you slightly improve the properties, but the main structure stays the same. How does that work with patenting? Would you be able to then patent the, that drug as yours, or uh, or would it still belong to the company that originally developed it? Well, first, it depends how um, the original molecules was protected. Um, you know that uh, there are several layers of, of ways of protecting molecules. You can either protect the structure, or the use, or the way to make it. So uh, it's a it's called composition of matter. So it's it's uh, the molecule itself or the class of molecules. It's use patterns or process patterns. Um, the uh, case you describe, let's say, um, let's take ibuprofen that everybody knows. Um, in ibuprofen, you've got a small alkyl chain, you've got an acid, you've got a, a, a banding ring in the middle. Um, let's assume that this is patented and this is coming off patent. Uh, you could, if the original patent did not in include a replacement of the benzene by, by a bicyclopentane, for example, uh, you could claim this as a new composition of matter, as long as there's no prior art uh, in between. So in theory, yes, you can generate new IP. And that's actually one of the things that uh, our clients are looking for now. It's um, they want properties. Uh, Fischem properties or biological properties. They want uh, novelty and they want also to secure uh, their own IP. Yeah. 
how do you as a company prevent intellectual property from being lost? Well, there's a lot of uh, trade secret. Um, the problem is working with building blocks, it's very difficult to protect them all because um, uh, the, the diversity of molecules that we make uh, does not allow us to file a patent for every new molecule that we make. It would be too expensive. So there's obviously a lot of trade secrets. So we don't share um, uh, we don't share the procedures to make those molecules. Uh, sometimes we don't even show the molecules uh, only under confidentiality agreements, um, and and that's how we try to protect uh, the knowledge that we have uh, as program for what we develop. In some cases, we file patents. Uh, so we, for example, have uh, filed a patent to for the synthesis. So it's a process patent for the synthesis of uh, of bicyclopentane molecules, uh, and we believe it is the most efficient uh, way of making those. So hopefully one day when uh, someone gets on the market with and needs to make a ton of it, they will uh, need uh, our patent for that. So that's one way to 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 protect. Um, but trade secret is probably uh, and confidentiality is probably the best way to do uh, I, I, at the beginning uh, when we were a young companies the first few years we were very naive i would say and uh, we would publish on the website uh, every new molecule a new building block that we thought was interesting just for uh, to advertise and to to uh, so that people would buy them from us and uh, we realized that uh, on average one between one and two months after we put new molecules on the website, uh, they would be they could be found on uh, on uh, catalogs uh, of uh, low cost uh, companies. So that's what you know prompted us to stop uh, sharing uh, novelty uh, or novel molecules, uh, uh, or at least uh, only under uh, under CDA, so confidentiality to our clients. I mean, it's it's a good tip. Because I probably would have done the same thing, especially when you're a new company, you just want to show people all your ideas and what, what you want to do. So it makes sense. Um, but how do you prevent intellectual property from being lost with workers? Because maybe you have workers that will start, will get to know all your procedures to synthesizing spiral cycles. And then when they leave, how do you prevent them from taking all that knowledge and doing something for themselves? Well, we cannot brainwash uh, employees, uh, obviously. So um, yes, there is, there is a risk that uh, they go elsewhere and, uh, and with knowledge. But uh, again, um, it's, uh, you cannot prevent that. They, we have in the contract, in the employment contract, uh, very strict uh, clauses about uh, confidentiality, about uh, intellectual property. And uh, and people tend to to follow that because uh, it's a small world. Uh, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, behave um, like this. You know, take ideas and go somewhere else to to to, to sell them or to use them. Um, it uh, chemistry uh, is such a small world that uh, you would not do yourself a service to to do that obviously. But uh, you're right, it is a possibility that someone lives with some knowledge. As long as the knowledge is not used uh, in a competitive fashion, we're fine with it. Um, uh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, and so who are the people that, are there companies that do something similar to you? Or would you say that you are the the only people on the market right now that do spiral cycles? Well, we like to think we're unique, obviously, um, but um, there are other companies that uh, sell or make uh, spiral cycles or other building blocks. Um, we are unique in the sense that, uh, well, first we innovate, we make new ones all the, all the time. And again, it's not only spiral cycles. Uh, actually, it's, 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 uh, it's something that we've been thinking about, you know, changing the name of Sparrowcam because um, I, I still uh, meet people um, uh, who say, I love spiral cycles, but I don't need one for my project right now. And, you know, I say, but, you know, we do a lot more than spiral cycles. So uh, uh, don't be obsessed with spiral cycles, even though they are really cool and, and very useful. They're uh, so cool. <laughs> I would be obsessed with them. You, you can do, uh, we can do a lot more than spiral cycles. Um, so, yeah, we, we were thinking about uh, changing the name um, uh, 
but uh, yeah, I, we have also reached a stage where Sparrow Cam has become a brand, and uh, and people know about it. So yeah, it's it's uh, you have to to be careful. It's like Amazon; uh, they used to be known to sell books, and and uh, and now they sell everything. But uh, yeah, it took them a, t- a while to to so that people stop thinking of them as a, as a, as a bookstore. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, Sparrow Cycles is uh, you you can find them uh, from uh, from other vendors. Um, we think we're unique because we are developing new ones, but more importantly, we develop methods. So it's not only about uh, the spiral cycle itself or the, the building blocks. That you buy one gram in a bottle and you use it in, in your in your project. It's in fact how you can connect this spiral cycle efficiently to the rest of the molecule. Um, if you have on the carbocycle uh, on the spiral cycle, if you have a uh, carboxylic acid, for example, that uh, is a good handle to attach it to an amine to form an amide bond. That's easy. But uh, let's say you want to connect it from another point, another heavy atom in the spiral cyclic structure. Then you need to, to develop a method, for, for example, using CH activation or late stage functionalization. And that's what we are very good at. So in fact, we have developed not only the, the, the building blocks themselves, but also the ways to decorate them or to introduce them at a late stage. And for that, I think we're unique. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so in terms of spiral cycles, there's other companies that do it, but you're still, you probably are the leader in it because you have all these methodologies that other people might not have. And then. Yes. And, and, and also uh, there is, um, you need to be careful uh, uh, when you look at catalogs, uh, there is the real, ca- the real things and the virtual or at least things that are on paper, but uh, have never been made uh, in the lab. And we know, I think what we, we are probably the company in the world that has made the most spiral cycles or bicycles or complex structures. And what we've learned over the years is what we can do and what we cannot do. And in fact, this is what saves you the most time. Knowing what doesn't work saves you a lot of time in the, in the, in the lab. So whenever we need to make analogs uh, or, or, or resynthesize or, or introduce those molecules or build them differently, we know what we can do and we know what we cannot do. So we are a lot more faster than anyone else uh, at doing those. Can you disclose? Speed, speed is very important. Can you, can you disclose what kind of things you cannot do? No, no it's, it's that, and especially for the audience that is not, uh, uh, not so only much. chemistry based, that would be very boring, ah. I, I would say. But, um, uh, and it, it's so general. Let's say, you know, every molecule is made uh, by a succession of uh, chemical transformations. Let's say it's, it's five steps. Um, uh, and a good chemist would, uh, would uh, say, okay, I will create this ring. And then I will build the other one onto the, the first ring. Um, and uh, on paper, it makes sense. But sometimes because of a ring strain, if you want to close a ring that is too small, there will be a lot of ring strain that would prevent the second ring to, from, from closing. And this, if you are not prepared or if you don't have the, the tricks to, to, to make it work, then uh, you will not be able to 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 make uh, those, your spiral cycle or your other complex molecule. All these things we learn over the years, and uh, obviously we keep track of it. Uh, we uh, we have uh, electronic no- uh, lab journals that uh, so we can go back and and see what what happened, and and we have also uh, collected this information and uh, and uh, concentrated it in, into a document. So that every time we need to make a certain class of uh, molecules whether it's power cycles or bicycles or, or, or preach, uh, preach uh, cycles, uh, we know what has been tried, what worked and what didn't work. It's, it saves a lot of time. And that's what also our clients are coming to us for. They want to, to, to get faster to the result. Do you think there's more, um, there's more of a demand for you to produce um, bigger molecules, or do you think there's more of a demand for you to produce spirocycles? Who are your main clients? So we, we do. So, so uh, as I said, we started uh, um, wanting to sell building blocks, uh, uh, not larger molecules, not 
uh, the full molecules that will be tested onto a bi bi biological target. Uh, we only wanted to make the pieces to uh, so the, the Lego pieces, if you want, um, and to sell it to Big Pharma. Actually, this is now a minor part of our activities. It's less than 20% of uh, our revenues. We do more than 80% uh, working with biotech companies, so small companies. Very often, they don't have their own uh, chemistry labs, and they rely on us to not only make the pieces, but also assemble them together to make the final molecules that they will test uh, in biology. So um, to answer your question, our main clients are biotech companies, and we do everything from the building block design to the assembly of, of the full molecule and the, the medicinal chemistry um, effort where we can modulate the properties of the entire molecule uh, based on the results that we receive. It's called structural activity relationship studies. Uh, and it's, uh, it's how you optimize a molecule uh, so that it, it has the best properties possible uh, to become a, a drug. Do you also work with any research groups or is it strictly just biotech companies? So we have some collaborations with, uh, with academic groups uh, because obviously we have internal R&D. Uh, not all the chemists at Sparochem are working on building blocks, so production of uh, small quantities of building blocks or on uh, research projects with biotech companies. Uh, there's always a, a small team doing uh, research for internal purposes developing new uh, new compounds, new, 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 new molecules, um, uh, testing hypotheses, developing new methods to, to decorate or to make those molecules uh, more complex or, uh, or attach them more efficiently. Uh, but obviously, as a small company, we need to, to we cannot invest so much in R&D, or at least not as much as we, we would want. And for that, we have collaborations with academic groups. Some are financed by uh, the Swiss government, by grants. And uh, for example, I mentioned the one we are on, on AI and machine learning with Geneva, but we have also another project with Professor Morendi, uh, at, uh, who was at, uh, yeah. at uh, IMPI uh, yeah, yeah. before, uh, who's now at ETH. And uh, we have uh, this uh, collaboration with him to develop new uh, concepts for uh, CH activation. Uh, so that's one uh, collaboration. We have a collaboration with the David Sala at the University of Pavia in, uh, in Italy. Um, and we see that as, uh, as a very good way for us to be exposed and to expose our chemists to, to novel uh, chemistry. Um, one of the problems we see in industry is that uh, once you start your job, uh, you finish your studies, PhD, postdoc, you get a job, um, you become uh, very specialized into your project. Let's say you work for a pharma company, you will work on a medchem program. You will be the expert at designing molecules for this particular application. But you don't have you don't have time to look at the literature to follow what's what's new. Um, and um, and over the years, you probably if you are not really proactive at doing uh, at educating yourself you will probably you lose the the, the ability to 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 follow uh, novel trends and we don't want that as our game obviously we want uh, our chemists to be always on top of the game um, and these collaboration academic collaborations are very good to to keep us engaged in a, in a, in in novel uh, novel chemistry so um how do you do any like press or something or how do you advertise your company to other people um maybe it's like easier with companies with biotech because i think maybe through word you know it's just like everyone will talk and so people will know you but for example maybe with research groups as well because i actually ordered two of your molecules for my paper because i thought they were really interesting to put on um to put on so to do what i was doing um, but yeah, I don't think I didn't know you guys beforehand, and I don't know if a lot of other research groups do. So, what kind of advertisement do you do? Um, that's interesting. So there are different uh, levels of uh, of uh, of communication. Uh, um, we obviously started. Uh, we wanted to sell products or services 
Um, so we wanted to be seen by the clients, uh, so pharma or biotechs. And for this, it's all about you know using uh, novel uh, uh, digital uh, platforms. Uh, we use LinkedIn a lot. Uh, so we have uh, a, a, a big presence on LinkedIn. I actually uh, do notice that now because I do follow by, you. So I see it on By the posting, yes, exactly. So that, that's the place to be. Obviously, we use Google, Google Ads. You know, if you search for Oxeten, hopefully you will find Sparrowcam. So it, it, it costs some, some money, but uh, it's a way to do that. We go to conferences. Uh, we used to go to conferences uh, before <laughs> COVID. Um, uh, I was away probably uh, three months of the year going to conferences or to visit clients uh, to to make uh, Sparkem known. And I think we have now reached a certain uh, a level of of branding that people know us. So we can uh, we have less to do in terms of of uh, of. Uh, of uh, marketing, but we still have a sort of, of a constant uh, presence uh, on the internet. Um, but one thing we didn't realize is that uh, our clients could also be in uh, in uh, academia. Uh, and it's true that now we see more and more uh, uh, demand for our products uh, coming from uh, from academic groups. And and that's good because it means that uh, uh, if you use our uh, products in your project, Hopefully, you will uh, you will publish, and that will advertise some of the motifs, and uh, they will be seen by the by the by the, uh, the community more and more. And hopefully, they will trace it back to to, to Sparrowcam. So that is a, is a good way of, of seeing um, you know this uh, this uh, this presence in academia. But one last thing uh, that we realize is that we need to uh, to attract always the best chemists uh, at Sparrowcam, and the best chemists and uh, Chemists that are at the top of their of their science sometimes are still finishing their PhD or, or their postdoc. So we need to make ourselves known from them, um, and that's why we have now a sort of, of campaign of contacting professors or universities to make ourselves known not only as a provider of, of uh, molecules or services, but also as an employer. And um, I think we hired uh, recently someone from uh, from your group. Uh, yeah, yeah, you did. So, so that's uh, uh, maybe that's how you you found out of uh, about Sparrowcam. But um, but also we have started uh, several programs where we finance. PhDs or postdocs in academic groups. We have that, for example, uh, with uh, with David Sala uh, in Pavia, where we sponsor two postdocs and one PhD student uh, to work on on uh, uh, on new classes of compounds, so developing completely new uh, classes of compounds that we believe are interesting. So it, it has both, uh, obviously, the scientific uh, um, uh, appeal uh, uh, for that uh, that is needed for a PhD or postdoc to, to publish uh, uh, scientific articles. But at the same time, that will also, it will also uh, feed our own uh, internal R&D and will become one day, hopefully, some products or services that we can sell. And the idea is that those uh, those chemists that we uh, that are trained uh, and that are exposed to Sparrowcam, they will join. Uh, they will join Sparrowcam uh, later uh, for uh, to start their career. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we started that one year ago, and uh, next month. So uh, actually. This is recorded in June. I don't know if they, if I should say that, but we are recording this uh, this uh, podcast in June. Um, next week will be first of July, and we will have the first two uh, uh, members of this what we call the Sparrowcam Academy that were trained with David Sala that we join uh, Sparrowcam as uh, permanent employees. So oh, it's a, it's cool. a cycle that we have started, and and that is now going well, and it allows us to really. Uh, follow, train uh, uh, the, the people, and we know that when they start at Spark Game, they are uh, already uh, um, formatted to 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 bring uh, innovation to us. Yeah, yeah. Of course, though, all this uh, advertising and communication will be a bit harder if you change the name of Spirochem, because then you 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 yeah. go back a bit because everyone will still think about Spirochem. So you. What would you call it if it wasn't Spirochem? 
Well, you know, as I said, we thought about that, but now Sparrowcam has become a brand. So, um, and it's just our duty or to or our task to make people understand that Sparrow Cycle, Sparrowcam is not only about Sparrow Cycles. Uh, and uh, and the more we do that, and the more we interact with with the industry and our clients, the more they realize it. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not worried. I, I actually I like the name. You know, we 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 picked it uh, ten years ago. It uh, it has followed us. Uh, it would be difficult to change it now. Um, uh, also, from a personal point of view, uh, it's like a baby that we have seen uh, that and that we have uh, um, pushed forward and uh, and uh, educated. Um, so I think we will keep the name. It's just uh, that we need to be better at at. Uh, conveying the message that Sparrowcam is not only about Sparrow Cycles. Well, this podcast is a perfect place to start, you know, if you want to, <laughs> again, please. tell the audience that you're not just about Spiro Cycles, you're about a lot more, then hopefully yeah. the listeners will understand that. Um, yeah, so um, actually going back to this uh, program that you have with Academia and getting the people to then come work for Spirochem. So the, the techniques to make these Spiro Cycles um, there and the machinery, it's the exact same in a research lab as it is in your lab in, in Switzerland. So when you say research lab, you, you mean academic research? Sorry. Lab. Yes. I mean, yeah. academic lab. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, yes. So, uh, we are probably, uh, equipped, well, it depends where you are. I mean, at, at, uh, Max Planck, you are very well uh, equipped so uh, i i wouldn't call uh, the max planck the uh, average academic lab um and uh, so is uh, eth uh, uh, there are other labs around the, around the world that uh, don't have um, uh, as much uh, uh, resources as, as uh, you have or as we, what we've seen at, at ETH. Um, but I must say that we are very well equipped and we will equip ourselves. Uh, we keep investing to get more equipment uh, that make our job more, more efficient. Um, because we hire chemists, uh, we hire them for their brands, obviously, but uh, for the for they must have good hands in the lab, but there are things that are repetitive that are not necessarily uh, uh, done by uh, by a very well uh, uh, educated uh, chemist. You take purification; uh, every purification is automated at Sparrowcam. So we have MPLCs, we have uh, uh, HPLCs. So everything is done uh, to to save time. So you're not in front of your of your uh, glass uh, chromatography, just waiting for it to 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 uh, to elude by gravity. Um, actually, uh, during this time, the chemist can start another experiment or, or read literature or plan the next uh, the, the next project. Uh, so it's all about efficiency. So we will keep investing uh, in in new equipment uh, that will save operator time. To, to, so that we can re, uh, reuse this time to do more research. Um, and for that, you know, we have, uh, we have invested in, uh, in equipment uh, uh, in flow, flow chemistry. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, uh, photochemistry. So we are equipped with every, ca every kind of reactor. Some are commercial, some are homemade, uh, so that uh, we can work with every wavelength in every type of condition. We can do a little bit of pressure uh, chemistry. We can do uh, electrochemistry. Um, actually, everything that uh, that allows us to quickly reproduce um, uh, a, a new transformation that uh, has been published, so that we can learn about it and and apply it to our own uh, to our own projects. Um, that you know we want to be on top of, of uh, technology, so that we are very reactive. Do you think that at some point um, the lab is going to be so automated that you can cut the number of chemists that you have doing the work? <laughs> um, maybe one day, but uh, probably not before I retire uh, or even you retire. Um, there are some companies, very good companies, that, uh, that work on automation. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be automated, but um, I mean, chemistry is uh, still something complex. Um, that, uh, you know, it, it will take some time to, 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 to make sure. 
<clears throat> you know, every reaction is different from 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 the other, um, and uh, sometimes the byproduct or the product will crash out. And uh, you know, if you have an automated system that uh, that uh, that does not uh, prevent that, or it could block some filters, um, you know, I don't think that there will be one day uh, a robot that can do everything. But uh, but you can use automation for certain parts of, of the process that uh, that uh, frees some of your time. But the idea at Sparkem is not to cut on the number of chemists. The, the idea of Spar at Sparkem, if we want to use robotics or automation, it's to free that time to do something else, to do more research or to be more productive or to go faster uh, on a project. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole um, conversation about AI is the fact that, yeah, they're not, AI wouldn't be there or automation wouldn't be there to replace chemists. It's just you can use these chemists then to do something else. You free up other jobs and you have automation doing the, the lab work. I was just wondering if in general, if in chemistry, you think that that's going to come pretty quickly, that automation is going to start doing everything or if we're always going to need chemists. But I do agree that sometimes it's also that, that feel that maybe automation doesn't have. Well, and we've seen automation in, uh, in biology. Uh, you can do uh, high throughput screening. Uh, this has been applied. Um, and you could apply it when you generate very large libraries of, of compounds. But then it's always the same condition uh, for the same transformation. It's just that you have two parts uh, that are different each time. Uh, but when you uh, synthesize these molecules, it's never a one-step process. So you can automatize uh, the synthesis of, of a library for one-step process, but, uh, but the next step will require uh, another set of transformation that may not be uh, uh, where automation cannot be uh, applicable. So, yeah, it's, it, it will take a, a while before we get there. Don't I'm worry, assuming... you, you, you will still have a job for, for the <laughs> <Thank> next one. <laughs> <laughs> that makes years. me feel better. <laughs> no, um, no, I would love to see automation also playing a bigger role in chemistry. I think it's really important because I think chemistry is all about, as you said, speed and efficiency and reproducibility. And so I think their automation would be really important um, in mm. science. Um, so I actually wanted to ask your company, you guys work so much with smaller companies. You, I'm assuming that you produce things also on demand for a specific BioNTech company or for a, an mm -hmm. academic group. So does that slow down the process because you can't bulk produce and you always need to be having one person specifically target only making that one molecule for that one company? Do you think that slows you down a bit or is that what makes you actually so Good. No, so, so actually, so um, uh, uh, when we studied Sparrowchem, so the ground plan was to sell uh, our building blocks, uh, a limited set of building blocks, the one that we had uh, that we could make uh, um, to, to, to Big Pharma. And we did that and we generated some revenues doing that. But um, in fact, most of my friends told me, you know, from the Kara group, uh, they said, are you crazy? Why are you starting a chemistry business in a high cost country like, uh, like Switzerland? Um, and I said, well, because we are better at uh, doing it than uh, anyone else. But it's true that it has always been a, a challenge for us to be profitable or to, to make sure that we, uh, we can produce things in a way that is very efficient. Um, and we have had to learn about, uh, you know, to, to improve our internal workflows to always be efficient. You know, there cannot be any downtime at Sparrow Game. And we need always to think about how we could do, improve ourselves or, or, be, or be better. So that's what, you know, when we were working on, on purely on catalog business, that's, it was very, very important. But we have kept it in, in our culture and uh, in, in, in the workflows uh, remained, even though we have now switched to, uh, to, um, to service, as you described, you know, making uh, certain molecules, uh, specific molecules for, for, for clients uh, on request or as a collaboration. Uh, so we have kept, uh, you know, the productivity, the efficiency in this service business. And in fact, we are, it's, it's not slowing us down. We had, um, you asked before, 
what is the differentiation between Sparochem and, and other companies doing molecules like this, like uh, contract research organizations. We are just so much faster at, uh, at doing what we do. Um, that's what is uh, what makes us uh, uh, the best. You mentioned, yeah, that a lot of your friends were, were asking, why are you building a company in such an expensive country? Uh, yeah, in such an expensive country. So do you think that you, Spirochem will ever expand? Um, also maybe to build laboratories in other countries because then maybe the delivery cost will also be different since if you have to from Switzerland ship to all over the world is that an idea to build well, so uh, we we so as a small company we have uh, shipped uh, compounds or worked with companies in more than 30 different countries uh, probably every country in Europe where there is uh, there are um, biotechs or pharma uh, clients, uh, North America, obviously, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, uh, South Africa. So we we have sold compounds and shipped compounds from Switzerland to to all these uh, these countries. So um, um, we we being in Switzerland is not a hurdle for for, for that. It's uh, we have even sold uh, products to China or to to India. Um, so that's. Uh, um, being in Sweden is not a problem for that. Now, production costs. Um, well, in fact, we do less and less production of, of, uh, of catalog products, and we do more and more services. Uh, and for that, you just need to 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 be uh, to be the best uh, at what we, you do, and you need to have a sort of of a reservoir of uh, potential employees uh, that can come to you and, and join your company uh, and that are the best at, wh at what they do. And the good thing being in Basel, uh, we have already realized, you know, moving the company from Zurich, where we started to Basel four years ago, uh, it was a lot easier for us to recruit uh, because in Basel, there is a history of, of Big Pharma. Uh, with Novartis, Roche, Syngenta, uh, and other companies. So there is a, a, a reservoir or cr critical mass of uh, available scientists uh, or chemists uh, that we could hire. So we don't plan to move out of, uh, of uh, Switzerland, at least for the Sparochem operations, uh, for the service, for example. But um, we are not... Uh, I cannot say that we will not expand uh, beyond the borders of Switzerland, but that would be probably to, to either partner or acquire smaller companies that bring something different. Uh, because we are the best at what we do for synthetic chemistry, but maybe we will identify somewhere on the planet a small company that has a certain technology that could be very useful for us. In that case, why not? Mm -hmm. So if you look back to how the com company started 10 years ago, um, is this how you imagined it to be now, or is it even better? No, no, no it's it's um, well. It's difficult for me to to imagine what uh, how I was thinking at at the time. You know, it's uh, um, anyway when you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea, uh, you have to be extremely uh, uh, flexible. Uh, you need to, you need to be focused. You need to, but you need to be very flexible at at uh, what you want to achieve, and how you uh, you achieve it. Um, and I don't know any entrepreneurs that started a company, uh, and five or ten years later uh, has exactly the same business model. Your business model will evolve. As I said, we started with you know selling spiral cycles and building blocks from a catalog to big pharma. And now we sell services and solutions to biotech companies. Um, I cannot. Im I don't think I imagined ten years ago that we would be doing so much of that. So it's very difficult to predict. You just need to be very open-minded, uh, very flexible, uh, and and ready to, uh, to change, or to jump on opportunities when you see that something is 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 working. Just go full speed to it. And where do you see yourself in uh, in ten years, or where do you see Spiral come in ten years? Well, uh, I think we have now so the last three years have been uh, we have learned a lot, you know, uh, and we have seen the market evolve uh, a lot uh, with uh, needs for uh, the services coming from from biotech companies, and I think we have just uh, scratched the surface of that. So there will be. A lot more opportunities uh, for that, 
and uh, we will keep growing uh, the company uh, in for the synthetic services. So synthetic chemistry applied to discovery. Um, we, as I mentioned, we have started to, to develop some uh, computational chemistry, AI uh, um, solutions that we could also bring uh, in, the, in the basket with our, uh, our chemistry expertise. We are now uh, um, equipping ourselves with uh, with uh, robots to to measure uh, properties, physical properties of a number of different uh, compounds or laboratory compounds. Um, so all this will expand. The thing is, we want to grow. I know we will grow yeah, because there is a demand for it. Uh, in which direction will we will we grow more? I cannot tell you today. Uh, because it will depend also on the market reaction and the need of the market. Uh, but yes, for sure, we will grow. The only thing that uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, the limitation that we have set for ourselves is that whatever we do, we need to remain best in class. We are best in class for synthetic chemistry. Um, we cannot dilute this uh, this uh, uh, trademark or this uh, uh, this thing uh, by just trying something that where we are not good at. So whatever we do next, we need to to very quickly reach best in class status. Yeah. Okay. Then yeah, that's that's it. Then um, thank you so much for for this really interesting conversation. I learned a lot. I really hope the audience has understood um, has understood everything. Maybe we'll post some pictures of some cool spiral cycles. Um, so that the audience can visualize what we're talking about better. Yeah, and yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, I really, really appreciate it. It was a pleasure and a very nice discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, and if the audience uh, is interested in learning more, they can visit our website. Uh, it's the 10th anniversary, so we will post uh, some stories and, and, and content uh, over the next few months. Um, and uh, if there are any uh, passionate and talented uh, organic chemist that is listening and wants uh, to work in a, in a challenging, intellectually challenging atmosphere um, uh, where they can bring their own knowledge but keep learning uh, all the time, um, they should contact me. Uh, we are always looking for, for, for good talents. Yeah, perfect. That was good. That was actually going to be my next question if you wanted to tell the audience where they can find Spiral Chemistry, but I think the website is the main. And like you mentioned, LinkedIn as well, I think. Yeah, so sparkchem.com and we have also a page on, page on LinkedIn. That's it. Thank you all so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast with Tomas as much as I did. If you like our podcast, make sure to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and our Instagram page. And make sure to follow Spirochem on LinkedIn to stay up to date with their research. You can also find a link to their website in the show notes below. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srina Thrankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, bye!